Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. Folks, the man with nothing to say is back again. Um, I know I'm subjecting you to all these Halloween things before and after my videos. Forgive me. Um, even though I'll still be playing them after November 1st, um, and all those music channel things that end on November 1st, I nonetheless have saved in my uh, DVR. So I could play them all year, and I could put them in front of every single video I do, but I'm not going to subject the people that watch my videos to that. Um, just until, just until uh, Halloween's over, technically. Now for me, Halloween lasts well into November, but I'm not going to make you guys listen to any more past November 1st. Um, so, not having anything much to say, um, I decided... Um, I, you know, I've, I've got, uh, I picked up a, a, a few new CDs, um, I don't know, I don't generally like to review things too early, you know, um, I did pick up, actually just arrived today, the uh, Tangerine Dream Quantum Gate, is it? I'm getting confused with the other Quantum that they came out with, I think it's Quantum Gate, um, but I haven't even spun it yet, I haven't listened to it yet. Um, I'm deep in my Halloween stuff and other, uh, you know, some other other things. Um, so uh, no review of that uh, for a while, I don't think. Um, but what I decided to do here is because I want to do, uh, I'll probably do uh, this and one more video before Halloween or right on Halloween, and then get back to nor more normal stuff. Um, to whatever extent you can see it, I've got my back shelf there, kind of stuffed with some Halloween things, some are uh, brainies there. He's been in my bedroom on the shelf actually all year, I never actually put him away. Um, but I haven't been doing um, bedroom videos, uh, you know, my normal spot, so I brought him out here tonight. I'm just going to do some vinyl pulls and, and uh, talk about them and, um, you know, just hope that I don't accidentally pull out my Partridge Family or Brady Bunch albums, but we'll see what happens. Uh, too easy. Some of these are just too, you know, I got to really, I have a lot of electronic and specific jazz artists and ECM records back there. I might have to swap that out for the more obscure stuff that I have um, because, you know, 
who doesn't know Body Love? This is one of the early, not not one of the first Klaus Schultz CDs uh, albums that I bought, but it's you know up there amongst the first, uh, maybe half a dozen or so. Um, this is Body Love Volume Two, actually, which I. I um, they're they're very similar in terms of musical direction. There's a lot of upbeat percussion stuff on both of them, and strangely enough, uh, the first Klaus Schultz things that I bought, totally by accident, turned out to be the things that didn't have any drums on them. And listening to them now, those albums uh, like Time Wind and Ehrlich and um, Mirage, for instance, I think those were actually the first three that I bought. So it's strange that. Uh, the first three that I bought had no percussion on them whatsoever. I think they sound better now. I think they dated better because there's just something in the way that drums are recorded that very much ages a record. Um, from the 60s, from the 70s, uh, just the way drums are recorded are very different. And these Klaus Schultz albums, now at the time that I got into him, he had uh, about nine albums out. Um, and it, this is before his X album, I got into him. And uh, X was the first album, which was his 10th album, that I bought as a new release. Um, the, the two Body Loves, I, I, don't, I don't list them amongst my favorites, a lot of people do. I like the Mellotron work on here, um, but um, there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of up-tempo stuff with the drums and the sequencers going. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's uh, you can hear that it's you know recorded in the late seventies. When was this from? Seven, I want to say seventy eight, but I'm not seeing the date on here. This one was printed in England. This is an Island Records version. Um, so you get the Island with the um, nice album covers. You know their featured album covers. You even have a uh, Mirage right there. Um, I haven't played the vinyl in years. I've had this on Sun. I've got at least two different CD versions of this. Oops, it's upside down. See, it's right side up on this side. That's the island. Um, you know, when I when I this is more the kind of thing that if I were to compile some Klaus Schultz and I wanted to stick to his his early stuff, which is my favorite stuff, his first decade, uh, up until about 1980, actually. Um, and I wanted to listen to stuff in the car. I, you know, something like Ehrlich is very difficult to listen to in the car. There's no rhythm, uh, just like Zeit from Tangerine Dream, kind of. Um, and there's a lot of subtlety in an album like that. And when you're driving around in the car with the noise and everything, that's probably not an album to listen to. So this is more like uh, if I wanted to hear early Schultz uh, and I wanted to listen to something in the car because it's got a beat, you know, because it's got a rhythm, you know, this might be one of the ones I pick. Um, it's typically got three tracks on here. Star Dancer 2, which I guess Star Dancer 1 was on the first Body Love album. Uh, 14 minutes and 15 seconds. Moog to Q, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, or Mooget. 1315, which I think is the only one that doesn't have uh, drums in it, which is probably my favorite track on there. And um, the first side has a 29 minute track called Nowhere Now Here. I like the way it starts off. It starts off quiet. Um, there are drums there playing slowly, but then the rhythm picks up with the sequencers. And after about five minutes, it gets boring for me. Um, but I always stick with it. I always listen through. I always make a commitment to listen to the entire pieces and the entire albums. Um, but on that track, Nowhere Now, now Here, the 29-minute track, uh, there's some Mellotron there. I really dig the sound of the Mellotron on this. Uh, I do like this better than Body Love number one, actually. So, you know, I know I got a lot of Klaus Schultz in there. So I don't know if I should pull them or how I should work this in the future. Um, I think I'm just going to end up pulling a lot of artists that I've already talked about. Not the specific album, but uh, I've already done reviews of other albums of theirs. Like Keith Jarrett, I know there's a lot of Keith Jarrett in there. Let me just see what comes up next. Ah, <coughs> uh, I don't, you know, it's ECM, <laughs> of course. 
Here's one that they changed the cover of when they reissued it on CD. I love this album. Batik, Ralph Towner, uh, totally unique. The only time he played with, uh, so far anyway, the only time he played with Jack DeJeanette on a record, uh, and Eddie Gomez on bass, just a trio. Recorded January 1978. To me, this is really Ralph's prime period. Um, and so it's just got to Eddie Gomez playing the upright. And I'm trying to think. This I don't, I'm not sure. This may have been the first time I heard Eddie Gomez, but I'm not sure. Um, I got this one fairly early into my ECM Jack DeJeanette Association. Um, Jack is on drums, Ralph Towner, 12 strings and classical guitar and piano. Um, I had read at one time, many years ago, that this was his poorest selling album on ECM up to whatever date that was that I read the article, and a lot of people thought it was because of the cover. What you can't see is that the cover's mostly black, but there's little, uh, it, well it looks like it was a pink piece of paper that somebody just tried to color over completely in black, so with the glare and everything, I don't know if you're going to... There you go. You can pick up a little bit of the pink there, I think. Now, when they uh, reissued it, I don't remember what now what the CD looks like. It's not a huge improvement, but it's better than this. Um, and the credits are on the back, which is pretty much the only thing to look at. So much for having an album to stare at when you're listening to. There's not a lot there. This, however, is um, this is this is to me this is a hot album, and I guess it's Jack DeJeanette who's, you know, a fairly aggressive player, especially in, in improvising. Um, side 2 does the title track, Batik, which is over 16 minutes long. And it's uh, a little like jazz, you know, a little theme that uh, Towner wrote and came, and came up with. He, he, you know, wrote all the compositions on this. Um, but um, there's a lot of improvisation, you know. The theme is just stated at times and they go off completely on improvisations including, you know, Eddie Gomez and everybody. Um, and it's really intense, it's, it's quite a drum workout as I remember, uh, as well as um, the next longest track is Water Wheel, which is over nine minutes. <coughs> There's five tracks on the whole album. Water Wheel is the only track that I've ever seen uh, Ralph Towner re-record. So the other four tracks in this album are actually unique to this album. So there's not uh, alternate versions, and Ralph is, you know, very big uh, in both his Oregon and solo work. Uh, he re-records a lot of his old pieces, so it was a little um, odd to me, maybe, that um, four out of the five tracks on here never got re-recorded. There's n no alternate versions with different bands in there. Um, there's a, a couple more avant-garde tracks. Um, and I think it's um, Shades of Sutton Who is one track, which is four and a half minutes, and a track called Green, Green Room, which is about six minutes, and there's another piece, Trellis, uh, and I haven't given this a fresh listen because I didn't know I was going to be pulling this out. Um, there's a little more avant-garde stuff, especially when he brings in the piano. You know, I'm going to go listen to this now, you know, when I'm done, done here, probably. Um, you know, it, it's it's very intense with Jack on drums. It's a lot more driving than most of his more subdued works, um, and it's also a bit more on the avant-garde side. The the shorter pieces on here tend to be a little bit more darker. I can see a lot of people not liking them, but you know, I, for me, I I put this amongst my favorite Towner recordings. Um, not counting the Oregon stuff, which there's just so many of, I have to keep them separate. Um, this is definitely in my top five easily, um, and you know maybe even my top three um, of his albums. Just fantastic. Um, you know, I put Blue Sun up there in my top three. Uh, if you want to count Sargasso Sea, which is a duet with John Abercrombie, I put that up there. Jeez. Um, Solstice stuff is really good. There's a, you know, this, and this is all from the same period, from the, 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 really the mid to late 70s. He was really just, mid to late 70s, even early 80s, he was just really tearing it up. But Batik is a fantastic uh, album, and one of his lesser known ECMs, from 78, did I say 78? 
According to January 70, it's a fantastic album. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to have maybe an ear for the more avant-garde stuff and be able to tolerate long tracks because the, the, main, the main track on here is 16 minutes long and the next uh, track is 9 minutes long and that more than makes up uh, ha more than half of the album right there. Um, so you have to really be into, I guess, listening to uh, musicians uh, improvising and coming up with stuff based on a, on a theme. I'm just going to pick another one. I knew this was a twofer going for it because it's thick. Not an ECM. Ladies and gentlemen, West Montgomery Beginnings. Um, I had, this is, a, this is a twofer, but it's not specifically a reissue of uh, two albums. Uh, rather, it's um, a whole bunch of different sessions from um, 1957, 1958, and 1959 that um, West Montgomery recorded really just before he started his solo career. They were uh, appearances on other folks' albums that he did, uh, including his brother. His, the, his brothers had a band called The Master Sounds. Uh, which included Monk Montgomery on bass, um, Buddy Montgomery on vibraphone, and um, he also played piano as well. And so this was a compilation essentially of a whole bunch of tracks recorded on one, two, three, four, it looks like five or six different sessions, different uh, time periods. Um, starting December 30th, 1957 and going uh, to October 1959. And uh, some of them were with the Master Sounds, which was uh, Wes guesting on his brother's band's records. And others were, um, seems like his brothers are playing on almost all of these tracks. But I don't know if they're all specifically uh, master sounds recordings or not um, but this was a this was a after you get into Wes um, this even predates his his rivers his early Riverside material but I think he started recording on his own in 1959 so just um, right around the time that this album ends there's probably some overlap with when he actually did start recording as a leader on his own his first Recordings were done just as an organ trio with organ, guitar, and um, drums. But um, this has, I remember, I haven't listened to this for a while, and I don't have these recordings. This album was not re-released on CD in this, in this format. You would probably have to go find the original um, albums that these are from, like the Montgomery Brothers uh, and the Master Sounds, which I think was just another name for the Montgomery Brothers. Nice liner notes. I wish it had two pages of liner notes instead of just that one big photo, but there's, there's, they're quite small and there's a lot to read. And there's also the liner notes do start on the back as well. Heavy cardboard. This is heavy. This, must, this is a really heavy pressing. Um, but it, his playing is slightly different there. Look at the blue note label. Um, Wes always had a very warm sound to his electric guitar, um, but these early recordings, especially I remember the ones from 1957, he had a, a, a more aggressive trebly sound. Um, so if you're real familiar with his playing, it, it's kind of interesting to hear him play in that way. And that could just be the equipment and the settings and all that that he uses on the guitars and amplifiers, whatever. But um, but uh, it, it, it's very interesting to hear him play with a slightly different tone if you're very familiar with him. And um, yeah, I gotta, I gotta hunt these down. I gotta see if these are even. I would imagine these are in print uh, on CD in some form. Um, these five sessions, but I don't know. Uh, I'm not aware that they're put under Wes's name, so you'd have to go hunt down uh, his brother's recordings both as the Montgomery Brothers and as the Master Sounds. Um, yeah, and there's other people on here um, as well. Freddie Hubbard plays trumpet a bit on a few tracks. 
Um, Harold Land plays tenor saxophone. There's any number of uh, drummers. Pony Poindexter plays alto saxophone. Louis Hayes is one of the drummers. Um, Benny Barth on drums. There's a whole bunch of musicians on here. Uh, most of it's Wes with his brothers. And I kind of, I'd like to recommend it, but I don't know how you would find these recordings. I guess you'd have to you'd really have to look at um, some kind of online discography uh, of, of Wes's. And I'm guessing these... I mean, anything that Wes recorded, even if the album isn't under his own name, is going to have his name on it. So, um, you know, if you're looking at the Master Sounds of the Montgomery Brothers albums, they would certainly mention that Wes plays on them because he was the best known of them. Uh, let me do one more poll. I always go to different sections so that I don't pull the same artists twice. <clears throat> uh, this is a good one. Not on my top. Well, yeah, yeah this is real good. Um, Brian Eno's Apollo vinyl. 8.98. I bought it at an import record store, which is weird because it was. A, oh no, I bought it at Discomat. I got two different tags on here. Discomat was a chain that was here for a few years, but I bought my very first uh, one of my first Eno albums, or maybe my first Eno albums on. This is this is good. This is not so much of an ambient recording, even though it's been um, kind of loot, kind of kind of put in that category. Um, the pieces are all very short on this. There's uh, 12 pieces on, on this album. The album runs about uh, 48 minutes, it looks like. And um, I don't, there's, there's, there's one piece that's seven and a half minutes long, which is the final piece on the album. But apart from that, none of the pieces, uh, the remaining 11 pieces, even hit the five minute mark. So it's really, you know, not an ambient recording so much as, you know, it doesn't settle down long enough to kind of maintain a mood. Um, in addition to Brian playing on here, uh, Daniel Lenoir plays on here. Um, most notably, there's a couple tracks with some really, they're really the standout tracks of the ones I think that Daniel Lanois plays the um, pedal steel guitar on, uh, which is really pretty and really nice and very much in the forefront. Uh, and it might be only like two tracks on here, um, but it's it's a real good, it is one of uh, Eno's better albums, I think. I have to separate the, the, you know, the times when he goes and he does vocal albums with rhythms and you know more pop oriented song things from his instrumental works and then I guess his instrumental works a lot of them if not most of them are ambient and then there's this other category which I think this would fall into that's you know there's a lot of elements of um, his ambient work in here and indeed there's no drums in here but the pieces are all shorter and a bit more thematic um, and it wor it does work. It does work. His brother, uh, Roger Eno, plays on here as well uh, as Daniel Lenoir. And it's basically, I, I think, just the three of them. I don't see any other, yeah, any other musicians on there. This is this is definitely one that you know, if you're into Eno, you have to have. There's nothing difficult or dark about it. It's certainly uh, for a lot of people that aren't particularly maybe really heavily into listening to a, a single ambient piece of his that goes on for 60 minutes. Um, this is definitely something more accessible. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a good, it really is a good album. But strangely enough, I can remember the day that I bought this. And uh, driving home, driving home from the store with it. One of those things when you got a, uh, I didn't, the, the, the particular store that I bought this at wasn't the, the one that was actually real close to my house. Um, there was two roughly, in, I would say not even in the area. The second one was more than a half hour away. This is one of the albums that I, I can recall driving home with really wondering what it sounded like based on the fact that, um, you know, I was familiar with Eno, but I saw there were shorter pieces 
And with Daniel Lenoir and his brother involved, I didn't know what to expect because I was not, I hadn't heard anything uh, by Roger Eno at that time or Daniel Lenoir on his own. So I'm um, not going to go. I'm not going to do another another poll because the next time I come on, I probably won't have anything to talk about either. So I'll do another batch of vinyl polls and we'll see what comes out. Halloween's about a week away, I guess, roughly a week away. And um, I'm digging it. The guys on the back shelf are digging it. Ghosty here is digging it. And... Um, so I'm going to go, and uh, I'll be back, you know, with a, in a few days. I'll do another vinyl poll, and um, that'll be our last one to, uh, for Halloween, I guess. See you soon, guys. Tales from the Garage is brought to you by Monster Out. Just spray it once a day throughout your home and keeps all monsters away, even invisible ones. Say goodbye to ghoulies, goblins, gremlins, mummies, vampires, and the living dead. Not effective on witches, chicken men, or rhino girls. And by Smoky Brand Cigarettes. 9 out of 10 doctors recommend smoky cigarettes to their patients. Remember, gals love a smoky man. Smoky, the key to great taste. Tune in next time for more Tales from the Garage.